Hello everyone, it's Mick Sullivan, and this is The Past and the Curious, and this particular thing that you're listening to from The Past and the Curious is the fifth in our 12-part series called The Underwear Chronicles. And if you did not know, this is soon to be a book sometime in this year. Big success with the Kickstarter, thanks to you who supported that. Um, And there was actually really great news because the Kickstarter did so well that one of the goals was hit this target and then I have to write another chapter and we hit it and I have to write another chapter. So the book is gonna wind up being longer, more chapters than the Underwear Chronicle series. So that's really cool. Anyway, this episode is one of the first ones where the story might feel familiar to you. A long, long time ago, we did a story about Charles Lee and uh, that's who this episode is about, but it's completely different. It's rewritten, it's reimagined. The perspective has changed, but you're gonna recognize some of the story and some of the figures in the story, especially if you've listened to The Past and the Curious uh, for a long time, if you're an avid listener. But if you are not, you're in for a treat because Charles Lee, well, I think, I think the word frenemy would be the best thing to say about him and his relationship with George Washington. So let's get started. Historians have been pretty silent on the subject of George Washington's underwear. Maybe they feel funny about airing the first president's dirty laundry, but in reality, George had plenty to be embarrassed about. Like us all, he was far from perfect. One poor decision he made as a young soldier basically started the French and Indian War. So the next time you feel bad about a mistake, just remember that your questionable actions will probably never spark an international conflict. It would be nice to believe that whether he was starting wars or ending them, George Washington still stepped into his underwear one leg at a time. But it might not be that straightforward. Historians from Mount Vernon, which is George Washington's home, now a museum, they believe that George didn't wear underwear at all. Instead, he likely wore a long shirt, which he wrapped and tucked underneath, sort of like a diaper. So think about that the next time you look at his face on a dollar bill. Now, one man who was okay with letting George's dirty laundry flap like a flag in the breeze was his fellow general, Charles Lee. As far as we know, Lee never brought up George's diaper shirts, but he made sure to point out every other embarrassing matter personal shortcoming, and monstrous mistake in George's life. Charles Lee was probably jealous of George because he believed that he should have been the one in charge of the American army instead. And if you know anything about American history, you know that his wish never came true. Most people have never even heard of Charles Lee, which is a fact that would probably drive him crazy to know today. Unlike our robust reverence for George Washington now, Americans certainly don't celebrate Lee's birthday with mattress sales and a day off school, and they definitely haven't built gigantic stone obelisks in his honor in a town that bears his name. It's probably for the better, Lee DC isn't a very catchy name for a capital city. It's not as if he didn't try to carve his place into history though. Charles Lee's story can serve as an interesting reminder that things could have worked out very differently. What if it had been Charles in charge? Now, Charles made it well known to the Continental Congress decision makers like John Adams and Benjamin Franklin that he wanted Washington's job and all of the glory that went with it. He believed he deserved it with every fiber of his being, and he wasn't completely alone in that belief. It was actually pretty easy to see that he was the most qualified candidate for the job on paper. Charles Lee had one big problem, though. No one really liked him. It can be a big red flag when you can't get along with anyone and you are a very poor teammate. As a result of his flaws, Charles would find his underwear shining in the bright light of the day. Meanwhile, George would go down in history with the mythic record and pristine private underpants that Charles Lee wanted for himself. Charles Lee was born the very same month of the very same year as George Washington, February of 1732. Lee opened his eyes and cried the first of many cries in England, an ocean away from the infant George. 
Lee's father was so excited to have a soldier for a son that he enlisted Charles in the army at the ripe old age of 11. This may have had something to do with Charles's general unfriendliness. And for the rest of his life, he was busy doing army stuff. He was a career soldier with a chip on his shoulder. One of his favorite things to do was to criticize his superiors in letters whenever they made mistakes, which, as we've already seen, anyone can do. It was common for him to call his boss stupid, ridiculous, and absurd, or a blockhead who has sunk into idiotism. And all of that was just about one guy. Luckily for Charles, that blockheaded boss never saw that insulting letter. Luckily for us, a historian did. The French and Indian War would bring him to America for the first time in 1754 as a lieutenant. Another 21-year-old soldier fighting for the British, named George Washington, basically started that war when he launched an ill-advised attack on French troops in present-day Pennsylvania. Washington also became internationally known by the end of the war, which was unusual for a British soldier who never set foot in England. Most of the army, including Charles, looked down their noses at the British subjects in America. And Charles had a very long, skinny nose to look down. By the time Charles left the continent, he had risen to the rank of captain, married the daughter of a Mohawk Indian chief, had two kids, suffered a pretty nasty injury, and insulted all of his commanding officers. He didn't think that they were fit to polish his boots, much less lead soldiers in battle. It was probably for this poor attitude and quick temper that his Mohawk in-laws called him boiling water. It's also fitting because boiling water turns to steam and disappears, which is precisely what he did to his Mohawk family when it was time to go back home to England. In fact, no one even knows what their names were because he never even mentioned them in any of his letters or writings. Landing alone back in England, he found no wars to fight. So he picked fights of his own with anyone who disagreed with him or didn't live up to his ridiculous expectations. Eventually, the British army grew sick of him and decided to pay him half of his annual wages if he would just retire. He accepted the deal, but was still craving glory, so he became a soldier of fortune. This means other countries hired him to fight battles across the European continent. In exchange for money, he led troops and gleefully stuck swords and lead balls into other people. It was a pretty gruesome way to earn a living. But at this time, military glory meant a lot to a guy like Charles Lee. Plus, he was getting great battle leading experience and really building up his resume. At the same time, in America, George Washington resigned from the army, hung up his uniform, and was raising a family while dabbling in local politics and overseeing Mount Vernon, his estate, which depended on the labor of enslaved people. In 1773, three years before the Declaration of Independence, Charles Lee returned to America. Clearly not a father of the year candidate, he made no effort to find his wife and children. However, he was sure to surround himself with a bunch of dogs. Outside of war, dogs were the love of his life. This was probably by necessity, since very few people could actually stand to be around him. Plus, with a canine crew, he'd be a leader of at least one pack. It was common to see him traveling with five or six of his favorite pups. Though he was still technically a soldier in the British Army, Charles decided to join the American Patriots in their disagreement with Great Britain and the growing disdain for King George III. That disdain part came very naturally to him. Charles could easily get behind the idea of hating authority, but he may have genuinely felt like America deserved independence. On the other hand, he may have just been excited to know that if there was a war, he was in an opportune position. After all, he wholeheartedly believed that he was the only logical choice to lead an American army. And it was this glorious kind of role that he could really sink his teeth into. And he was right. No one else on the continent had more battle experience. But with a guy like this, it's hard to be certain of his motives. Either way, when the war broke out after America told King George III to take a hike, the job of leading the army was given to Washington. 
Charles Lee wasn't completely left out in the cold. He was given a good position leading troops as a general, but he wasn't top dog. This made Charles very angry, and he spent a lot of energy trying to make George look bad. But while George and the other revolutionary rabble-rousers stood in opposition to the King of England, they did so distinctly as Americans. Sure, Washington had been an officer in the British military, but the bad taste it left in his mouth led to his resignation way back in 1759. He was a traitor to the crown, but not the worst kind of traitor. The same thing could not be said for Charles. First, Lee was born in England, which was a big difference in the eyes of his fellow countrymen. Also, since he was still officially a British officer, his revolutionary behavior was especially villainous to his former teammates. Outside of winning the war outright, there was nothing British soldiers wanted more than to catch Charles Lee. But things weren't easy for George Washington. In the winter of 1776, things looked bad for the American cause. Washington had not won a major battle, though Lee had some success, which he told everyone about constantly. But the city of New York fell into British hands, and it looked bad for the American patriots. The Redcoats chased the embarrassed and overmatched ragtag American army out of the Big Apple and into the Garden State of New Jersey. Washington traveled at the head of one large group of retreating soldiers, while Lee was leading another, larger group many miles away. Washington wanted them to rendezvous or meet up and travel together, so he sent carriers on horseback to deliver letter after letter to Lee, but Lee did not react. It was a poor decision to ignore orders, but then Charles Lee committed an unforgivable act. He decided to spend the night away from his troops at White's Inn in the little town of Basking Ridge, New Jersey. To a degree, it's understandable. It was December, and he was probably tired of the icy cold that froze the East Coast, but he knew better than to leave his troops. With just a few of his officers and guards, he enjoyed a meal, stoked a fire, and took off his uniform to relax. Wearing his dirty dressing gown, which was about all he had for underwear, he tucked himself in for a cozy night of sleep in a nice, warm bed. It was certainly better than the cold, hard ground his men would have that night. When the next morning came, groggy Charles was slow to rise. Wiping the sleep from his eyes, he found his way to the table to write some letters, still in his dirty dressing gown. Maybe he was finally going to respond and tell George that he was on his way. Or maybe he was writing to complain to someone else about what a dunce he thought Washington was. Either way, his concentration was broken by the thunder of horse hooves coming down the lane. Not all Americans at the time were in favor of independence from Great Britain. The people who remained loyal to the King of England were known as loyalists. And one such loyalist had noticed Charles Lee and his small party of men the day before. Wishing to demonstrate his unflappable loyalty to the crown, this man told some British soldiers where the unfriendly American general was staying. The idea of capturing the traitorous Lee had the soldiers practically salivating like one of Lee's dogs pouncing on a ham bone. When they stopped in front of the inn and called out, Lee's surprised men scattered like ants in every direction. And Lee was not much braver. One report said the frightened and underdressed man panicked and tried to hide in the fireplace. It was pointless, though. He was trapped in his morning dressing gown. Bannister Tarleton, the man in charge, made it easy. Charles Lee could come out with his hands up, or they would burn the place to the ground. This was an unsettling thing to hear for the poor woman who owned the place, but even more so for Charles. It was the end of the line, and he knew it. To the delight of the British soldiers, when Charles Lee stepped out into the morning sun, he was still wearing his underwear. It's hard to imagine a more undignified surrender of an officer, which probably made his enemies savor it even more. Lee was not even given the courtesy of his uniform coat. They strapped him to a horse just as they had found him, threw a blanket over top, and rode all the way to New York City. 
Despite not liking him, the British, much like Charles himself, believed that he was the best soldier in America. So they figured with him imprisoned, the war would have to end soon. This would not be farther from the truth, though. Just a few weeks later, George Washington would lead the soldiers in a famous underwear freezing crossing of the Delaware to the Battle of Trenton. This reinvigorated the American cause and finally gave people the belief that an army led by George might have a chance after all. Still, the war would not end for seven more years in 1783. As it turns out, Lee was doubly traitorous. Surprise, surprise. While he was imprisoned, Charles Lee drew up plans for the British on how to beat the Americans. Luckily for him, these plans would not be discovered by Americans until long after his death. Well, all right, party people, there you go. Charles Lee, dirty underwear, maybe change your underwear sometime soon if you haven't in a while hopefully you have i yeah yeah I, you you're all you're all good don't worry about that hey um thank you so much for listening there's a new episode right around the corner and it's really fun i think it's a one of the subjects is um a subject that people have asked a lot about as you might imagine when you hear it but i am excited about the approach that we're taking so stay tuned let's just say that April 14th has something to do with it. That date has been a lot of things, so keep an eye out. My name is Mick Sullivan. Thank you for listening. Please, you know, tell somebody about the show, leave a review, anything you can do to help. It's all appreciated. I like making this show for you, and I want more and more people to listen to it, because I don't know, it's pretty cool. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye.